Hey everyone, happy Friday. Hope you had a wonderful week. Thank you for joining me on this week's episode of Brain Scratch. If you remember last week's episode, we looked into the case of Lauren Ag, and I promised I was going to try to get a very special guest. We do have that special guest with me, but before we introduce Sheila Wysocki to the rest of you, I'd like you to check out a trailer for her new podcast, Without Warning. Let's take a look at that. My friend, I can't find her. From the time I went to sleep to the time I went away, there's nothing. It's just a void. My baby girl's life was taken by unscrupulous individuals who may have done this before, but will probably do it again. Because obviously they they knew something and they hadn't reported anything. We're going into a death trap. It's a cliff on both sides, so we're literally staying. No one knows exactly where she was, but I mean, they said that they found a lot of blood on it. You, the only time you're going to report it is when law enforcement is en route to the body. There is something about being at someone's last place of life and knowing they were alive one second and dead the next. And he said, I need to tell you that your daughter didn't make it. She's dead. Hello, Sheila. Hey, how are you doing? Really well. It's very nice to see your face again. Um, I, I've already kind of explained to my audience in last week's episode, but I just really appreciated the kind of quick friendship that we developed at CrimeCon. Yes. Uh, um, probably one of the highlights for me in terms of going was your breakout session where we looked into the case of Jonathan Cruz. Uh, I know that it was a lot of work on you and threw you some unexpected curves. <laughs> just a little bit. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm hopeful that you're considering doing something like that again. It was just so neat to have that kind of interactive experience to be able to dive into specific elements of the case. Uh, I saw a lot of value in it. And one of the other things that I really appreciate about you is you seem to really believe in crowdsourcing. Absolutely. I think it's the wave of the investigative future. Yeah. And it's it's strange because occasionally we'll hear from law enforcement and it seems like they're not the friendliest. <laughs> uh, in some cases, we feel like they don't give us quite the right information in terms of what could help them. You know, like in, in some missing persons cases, I have trouble sometimes even locking down a decent time frame or location of where the person was last seen. But in investigations like this, when you really do need those tips to come in, I think I think that we're tapping onto something new here in terms of sharing information at this social media level. And mm -hmm. that way, people that are interested in the case, because either they're a friend of a friend or they happen to live in the area, um, they can actually help affect change in that. So I'm really thankful that you're that you believe in it so much like I do, I guess, is what oh, I really want to say. Absolutely. And, you know, the value of the public. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, time and time again. Now, I've heard from other law enforcement where they've been very clear cases don't get solved without the public's help, uh, especially some of these tougher cases. Absolutely. I mean, uh, that's the you. I think the reason you and I hit it off is we have the same mindset in that. And yeah. we believe in helping these families. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so how has been how has it been working on a podcast now for yourself? <laughs> It is. OK, so for the listeners, it is the most miserable way of doing the things because it's a lot of work. So kudos to John for doing it and doing <laughs> it as well as he does, because it is hard, hard work and it's long hours and it's getting in the way of my actual real job. So uh, hopefully the podcast will come out really. Uh, I'm doing the podcast for my clients it, to get information out there. So for that it's worth every second. I'm not complaining, but we've spent three days in editing. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I totally understand that. But I also appreciate your motivation for doing it. You're not looking to make the next serial or to, you know, make a hundred million views or something like that. You're really trying to help move the case. 
So I, it's, it's so funny. You should bring that up. First of all, I don't know how you get viewers. So this is, I, I just want the story to be correct yeah. and the information to be correct. So I don't know how you get viewers or downloads. I don't know how it, people are like, Oh, you'll make money on it. I don't even know how you do that. I know nothing. I just want the story to go out. And I know from using the media in the past, I get tips that's what I'm looking for. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and on last week's episode of Brain Scratch, as well as this week's, we are including your contact information for any tips in the description box below. Um, because we know that there isn't an open investigation happening with on the police end. So if people do have information, it's probably going to actually best serve the case coming to you guys. So a little bit of a change because typically on the channel, I will always include law enforcement. And quite honestly, if someone had... I mean, if you had a photograph of this woman being pushed off the cliff, please send it to law enforcement. Don't get me wrong. But in terms of the types of tips I think that we're looking for to help with this case, they're probably not going to be that strong and they need to get in the hands of people that are really working the case. So that's why Sheila's information is down there. Um, before we jump into Lauren's case really strongly, I want to ask, do you have any updates on the Jonathan Cruz trial? The Cruz trial, unfortunately, was moved to November 27th, oh. and that was um, actually right now I should be in trial. Um, so that's why we can talk is because it was moved. So um, the judge had some conflict, and that was the day they all agreed on it. Okay. Okay. Wow. Just another – Six breaks, times. Yeah. But it breaks my heart that, you know, the family is trying to get to this and just another stopgap more time that has to go by before before they get to present their argument but okay moving on to the case of lauren ag and just so everyone knows um last week when i did my initial episode i had only listened to the first episode of without warning sheila's new podcast so i was trying to keep my perspective um contained to the media and not have too much influence from Sheila's investigation because I was expecting to learn a lot more as I listened to the other episodes. Her team was kind enough to send me five of the episodes. I have now listened to all of them. I did indeed learn a lot more. Um, I have to say, I think you guys are onto something with this podcast format. It is very interesting taking it from the investigator's point of view. Um, I love just getting your mindset in there, why you pick these types of cases, how you're handling these types of cases. That's a real unique perspective that quite honestly, I haven't found the right product to do that yet for me, to really let me know how a PI works. Um, so that's a really interesting aspect to this. Did you find any benefit in going back through this case for the podcast? Absolutely. I Every time I review the documents or any of the pictures, anything, I find something new every time. If I don't, then I'm not paying attention at that moment. There's always something you're going to find. And so getting the, the pictures to you, I always look at them again. It's, it's important to not take things for granted and think, oh, I've seen that picture a hundred times. You really haven't. There may be something. Yeah, yeah. So, it's been great. And re-listening to the audio and I called every witness saying, I'm doing a podcast. Your information, your interview is going to be on there. And we talked some more and some things came, you know, just this week I'm talking to a witness and they said something. I was like driving my car. I go, wait a minute, I got to pull over for a second. I wrote it down. So I'm going to use that in the podcast and I've already sent it on to the attorney. Wow. Wow. Did you call Hannah just out of curiosity? <laughs> so Hannah has an attorney, so I, I'm not allowed to chat with them. Okay. Okay. Um, I thought that there's a particular episode where uh, Sheila, at, at least in the version I heard, plays most of the interview with Hannah. And there are some significant developments. We're going to touch on one of those as I get into the questions. But it was probably the highlight of the series for me so far, let me just tell you, in the episodes that I've reviewed. Once again, because we get a good sense of your approach. Um, but outside of that, there's just some very strong drama that happens during that interview. Um, the, the phone would not stop ringing, let's just say, that poor girl. Uh, and there's an interesting aspect in that where I honestly... Um, I sympathized with her quite a bit because of the position she was in where 
I honestly feel like she's trying to help you guys by opening up about this case and talking to you. And on the other side, she's got her now husband, correct? Yes, they are married. Yeah, that is essentially trying to stop that conversation in the middle of it actually happening. Um, also, just a quick note to everyone, we're having some slight connection issues, so please bear with us if you see her turn into a bunch of colorful blocks. <laughs> please know that it's still it's still Sheila, and we will press on through the interview. Um, okay, so let's back the story up a little bit. Uh, just to get the timing right, because the Crime Watch Daily segment, I think, kind of mashed the days together in a strange way. They drove up on Friday, right? They drove up Friday, the 24th. Okay. Uh, and then they were there all of uh, during the day on Friday, having fun. Right. Well, uh, Friday late afternoon. Okay. And then Saturday, and then, of course, Sunday. Okay. Um, that Wake Fest is three days. And as we're talking, Wake Fest is this weekend. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mentioned that in the episode as well. Oh. Um, it's, okay. it's really mind blowing. Um, and, but it's part of, you've actually helped make that happen because you're releasing the podcast on the three year anniversary of, uh, which was yesterday when this is aired. So, uh, you guys can check out the first episode, uh, now as a matter of fact, no. Uh, yes, you're right. Yeah. You're right. Sorry. That's all right. Remember, we're in a we're in a time machine here. <laughs> you're right. You're right. Okay. Um, so we're actually talking about two nights that they stayed there. The first night on Friday night, where do they sleep? The first night they did sleep up at the at the cliff. Okay. Okay. So they stayed in up Saturday, there. In Saturday night, just so you know. Uh, say that again. On Saturday night, too, they went back up to the cliff. I, I don't know. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. That's okay. That's okay. Um, and I've seen, uh, first of all, is camping even allowed up there? No, it's federal land and nobody should have been up there. Okay. Are there any mechanisms to try to stop people? I mean, do they literally have signs or? No, nothing. there's nothing. Okay. Nothing. Gotcha. Um, I have seen all kinds of com conflicting info about who actually set up the camp. I've seen reports that say it was set up by Aaron. Uh, I've seen reports that say specifically Bricks, Graham Bell. Uh, is, this, is it Bricks, Graham Bell or Hydrich? Because I've also seen it seems like he has two last names. Yeah, it's Bricks Gambrel. Okay, Gambrel. Um, I've seen that he set it up. I've even seen uh, Sheriff Ray making statements that make it sound like Lauren actually set up at least the hammock herself. Uh, who set this camp up? So we have an interview, a voice interview saying that Bricks and Aaron set it up. Okay. Now, do we know that, that they set up the individual hammocks as well? As I understand from the interview, yes. Okay. And does any of that tie into the wrongful death suit? Yes. So uh, part of the wrong, and I'll probably stay away from a lot of the legal stuff because I don't want to sound like I'm an attorney and yeah. act or acting like I'm one. Um, but in the lawsuit, it does talk about Bricks and Aaron setting up the, the campsite. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. I mean, if, if we're talking a wrongful death, even if we're talking outside of some type of homicide situation, just a pure accidental situation, and we're not talking about looking to place full blame, but some level of responsibility, uh, I think that info is probably going to be very important. And that's why I was really confused when I'm looking through all these articles and I'm like, wait, they're saying it's Aaron. They're saying it's Bricks. Over here, they're saying it's Lauren, but it's actually Aaron and Bricks, according to the info you have. Right. And as I understand it, Bricks and Aaron set it up and then Chris showed up and it was already set up. Okay. Got it. Got it. Um, so Friday seems to go okay. Um, we have this interesting story, which I really didn't cover on last week's episode, about a cliff diving accident. Now, is this from the same, supposedly, is this from the same cliff where they're spending the night? Correct. It is supposedly from that cliff. And what day does this accident happen? Uh, they said it happened on Saturday during the day. Okay. And the story is that Lauren decided to do a cliff dive and hit some rocks on the way down and wound up injuring her head and that she might have passed out for a few seconds, right? That is the story. Okay. Um, 
And I'm, I'm getting a strong sense from you that you're not quite sure if this is true or not. I know what happened and that is not true. Okay. Um, but according to what we're being told, supposedly there's this accident. She's seen later that night in a bar. People say she's fine. No one, uh, does anyone support the information about that story? Does any other witness say I heard about that or I saw it? So she did cliff jump. She okay. didn't go head first. She didn't pass out and she had no bruising as been reported, zero bruising. Okay, gotcha. And it was just to be clear, I go by, you know how I am, the information has to come from a really credible source and it came from a nurse. Okay, okay. So did like she, that. <laughs> yeah, did she seek help? No, it just happened to be a friend of Lauren's and, and it came up. Okay, okay. So. We do think that there was cliff diving, but we don't think that she injured herself, at least in the way that was described, traumatic head injury type of description. Correct. Okay. Gotcha. And to be clear about that, I want to point out one other thing. I don't know if the recording's in there or not, but even Aaron says she didn't have a problem with the cliff jumping. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Uh, no photos or video of the actual cliff jump because I see online a lot of kids like to do it and there's plenty of videos out there and adults actually let me be clear <laughs> yes. I'm seeing guys my age that are jumping off that cliff as well um, no video though of that no. actual okay no no video and that is surprising especially considering this group of kids that they didn't memorialize it. It kind of is. I mean, they had a, a whole bunch of uh, social media trail driving up there, but then you actually get there and you do something as brave as that. And you don't capture that for, you know, a Facebook post or for Instagram or something kind of strange. Right. Plus, well, I have a theory on that with all the pictures are probably gone from the other. We have Lauren's phone, right. but everybody else's we haven't been able to get. Okay. Okay, but you didn't find anything on Lauren's phone for any no. of that? Okay. No. Um, have you traced, well, I was going to ask, have you traced where that story originated from, at least the elements about her head wound? Do you know where that started? Um, I know, I know, I know where it started. And um, I have talked to the witness who made that statement and they did not go into the, she hit her head and things like that. It just kind of got blown out of proportion. Oh, okay. Um, did that seem to happen after she was found deceased? Yes. Okay. That's kind of what I was concerned of. Basically my gut feeling is that this story is changing because people are looking to blame some of the damage that was found on her body on that accident, as opposed to something else happening to her. Correct. Okay. Gotcha. <laughs> um, now, one of the things I was concerned about in this whole story is her ability to be sleeping on this hammock that apparently from the photo looks like it's pretty dang close to the edge of the cliff. I've been up to that cliff, believe it or not, and it is literally hanging over the, the water and rocks. Wow. But we do but, know that. Yeah. But you're, that's not where she was, even though it's easy to say she was hanging over because she has pictures and stuff, but she wasn't there that she wasn't, you know, um, that's not what happened to her. <laughs> you're, you're talking about at the actual time of, of her death. Right. She didn't fall off that side. That's the 90 foot side. And okay. then there's the 45 foot side. Right. And the 45 foot side is the side that for a fall actually looks a bit more treacherous because you've got a lot of rock and debris and trees and all kinds of stuff to contend with. Right. And, um, I don't know that it would have been very safe to fall off the 90 foot side, but if she had, she might've actually cleared it and got to the water. Right. Right. Okay. Gotcha. Um, in an interview with Chris that I heard on without warning, uh, he mentioned that there was actually other hammocks there. How many were set up? So there were six. Six. Uh, but they wind up sleeping in the same one? That's what was told to us, yes. And does it make sense for how many people that were up there that they would have slept in the same one? Um, 
you know what? I'm sure there were a lot of pictures taken and stuff. I don't, I don't know if they slept in the same one. I do know that they sat in the same one, um, you know, throughout the day and stuff. But I doubt that story, whether it's Friday night or Saturday night, that she slept in a hammock with anyone. Yeah. Yeah. And I've talked about that a bit in last week's episode, and I've seen comments from viewers about this as well. Uh, it would be pretty not just tricky. It'd be kind of scary to have two people in one hammock if there was a drop even close to where that hammock is. Uh, getting into a hammock isn't all that easy just on your own sometimes. <laughs> to imagine navigating two people in the same hammock kind of sounds a little, little tough. So the hammock is not what um, you think at the Keys, you know, the flat kind of hammock. Mm-hmm. The particular hammock they have really engulfs you. Yeah. So it kind of it's it's a lot harder than a typical hammock. So you're right. It's it doesn't make sense for two people to sleep in that hammock. And if one person moves, you would know it. Yes. Yeah. And that's obviously a big point of contention when we're talking about what Chris is saying. He woke up the next morning. He he thought she got up, but he's not really clear about did she get up or not, says he didn't really feel it. And because of that, he doesn't really know what time that she left the hammock. Uh, And outside of that, we have a very strange thing in that Lauren has a boyfriend at the time, uh, has gone to this weekend and has talked to other friends about the fact that she does not have any interest in Chris. Right. But there's a video where Chris in the in the bar, there's a video um, of Chris walking past Lauren, and you can see her face. Yeah, doesn't take a, a scientist to look where she's kind of like, ugh. Yeah, wow, wow. So the whole story about them sleeping in the same hammock together uh, really has a lot of challenges, even the way that I'm looking at it. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, Now, she had a cell phone. I understand that the battery was dead, Um, but was there any activity that was trying to be sent to her phone or anything going on with her phone that specific night? Yes. There's um, a lot of things that did not go through. There's no cell service up there. I've been up there a lot. There's zero cell service. I don't care. You're just not going to get anything. Okay. But at some point down there, there must be some decent service because she did reach out to a friend and ask to be picked up, right? Mm -hmm. Right by fish lips, not where the cliff is, but by fish lips, you can get, if you stand right and you kind of twist your head, you can get some cell service. Okay. And I haven't shared these details with the audience yet. So it, her friend's name was Jade, I believe. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Jade. So Jade, and it's a text exchange that happened with Lauren? Correct. Where Lauren was basically saying, I'm not having a great time. And this is on Saturday evening. Correct. And asks Jade, will you come and get me? And Jade says, it's a bit late. And uh, honestly, to get out there, the roads are so windy and I, I don't like going out there at night. So I don't think anybody would have gone and gotten her except for her mother. Gotcha. Gotcha. Wow. I really wish she would have sent her a text message that would have changed this whole thing. I know. Um, so we hear about the text to Jade. Uh, Hannah then talks about a story where she says that Lauren was going to drive home drunk that night, that Lauren just really didn't want to stay. And it was Lauren's car that they had taken out there. So she was going to drive herself home. And Hannah and the boys decided to take her keys from her. Correct. So Lauren did not have her keys. And Lauren did ask another girl to go with them, to go home with them. Okay. Okay. So it's multiple people that she asked to go home. Do we know why she's asking to go home? So by, by so many people? Um, from what I understand, interviewing um, is that she said they were being mean to her. The group that she was staying with? Right. Okay. And that's kind of that kind of leads me to another question I was going to ask. The closest thing that we have to a disagreement that we know about that we can at least get them to admit to is the fact that she wanted to drive home and they took keys. They took her car keys from her. Correct. Um, do we have any other motivations in terms of why they'd have a disagreement? Not not solid. No. Okay. Not, I, and I'm real careful about 
yeah. not things I can't prove. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess we could pontificate that maybe there's some rough feelings going on if Chris is indeed romantically interested in her and she's kind of brushing him off, something along those lines. Or if Aaron was and there's a bit of jealousy. Very interesting twist I did not expect to come up in this story is uh, Aaron actually being involved with it in some way. And we're going to get to some information about that here. I've got another question before we get to that. Um, and it's really about what time did they go back up to that cliff? I've seen a statement from Aaron where it looks like he says midnight. Uh, we have Yarchuk saying, no, I saw them at 2 a.m. before they went back up. Do we have a definitive time frame locked down of when they got back up there? Um, I believe that we have been there. We have other witnesses. So uh, other than Chris Yarchuk and Aaron, we also have a friend of Lauren's name, Evan. He was with her that night. And so based on that, we can put it between 2.30 and 3.30. Okay. Okay. So midnight's definitely out. We know it was a number oh, of hours after that. Okay. No, it was not midnight. Gotcha. Um, so there's some information I found in the press that um, had come out after the fact of another potential witness named Chris Brown and that he saw Aaron. Well, he thinks it was Aaron. He saw some guy come swimming up to the dock uh, that was exhausted and was spitting water out and cursing. And um, I just wanted to run that info by you. What's What are your thoughts on Chris Brown? Is this really him seeing Aaron? Is he getting Aaron confused with someone else? And this happened around midnight, according to Chris, which the timing Correct. is once again messed up. So here's the way I look at Chris Brown. I did not interview him myself. I knew his story. He has signed an affidavit. He's a grown man. Mm -hmm. He's not a kid. He's a grown man with a wife and children and really no reason to interject himself into this story. Um, the thing that got him was the bathing suit. And the bathing suit does match up to what Aaron had on. Okay. So I, I personally don't give him any credence because... I didn't interview him and the time's off. I don't know. Okay. Um, let me just tell you that we're on the same page there. Uh, even when I was first reviewing the information, especially with the time frame discrepancy, uh, I was wondering if, if he was right. I think we've got a guy that's trying to be helpful, uh, you know, saw the news coverage, thought he might have some information to contribute, and maybe the news actually ran with that a little bit stronger than they should have at the time. But um, yeah, the time frame is really a problem for that sighting for me. It's the one thing he has though, that that's why I'm kind of is the bathing suit. Yeah. Well, is it possible? I mean, is it a popular style? Is it something that, I mean, you've got a couple thousand people out there for this event, right? Sure that, but it's a, I don't know. It's that flag kind. I don't know. Is that popular? You're a guy. Mm. <laughs> Would you wear that? I don't know. What, what's the description on it? It's a, it's a flag um, bathing suit, uh, longer, you know, not the Speedo kind, but the kind that goes to your knees, and it's an American flag. Sounds kind of common. I, I do. Is it? Okay. Yeah, I do think uh, an American flag. You guys, let's talk about it in the comments below. Let me know what you think about an American flag bathing suit. I'm pretty sure I've seen those even at discount places. <laughs> um, I, th I think it might, be, it might be common, but why don't you guys actually let us know? Um, Okay, so we get to whatever happens in the middle of the night and we get to Sunday morning. Do we know what time Hannah, Aaron, and Chris wake up? Um, from when I interviewed Hannah, she did not know what time. However, after interviewing people on the dock that morning, it had to have been before 8 o'clock. Wow. I mean, these are kids out to 2.30 partying hard and you think they're up that early the next morning? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and on Sunday, what time was Lauren's body actually found? 4.30 p.m. on Sunday afternoon. Okay. So from 8 a.m. when they supposedly woke up till when Lauren's body is found, which is 4.30? 4, 4.30 4 p.m. We've got a huge chunk of time. And sure. what are Hannah, Chris, and Aaron doing during this time? So the reason we know they were on the dock is because they went over to the dock from the cliff and they got on a boat and went to Wakefest. They went to Wakefest. Yes. And we have pictures of them on a boat 
at Wakefest. So when you say they went to Wakefest, they, they went to the actual site where the competition was continuing? Yes, where it's about six miles out from where the cliff is located. And how do they how do they get there? They jump on someone else's houseboat or Chris Stout, uh, Chris, yeah, Chris had a boat when, uh, you know, uh, I don't know. I don't know boats. Okay. He had a real boat. Okay. So he had a boat there. They get on that boat and they go out right. and they watch more of this competition. Yes. Even though Hannah says she's concerned about what's going on with Lauren because Lauren's flip flops have been left behind. Her cell phone has been left behind. They have her keys. Uh, did she have a purse of any kind? She had a purse and it was up there as well. So all of her personal items are left behind. Correct. Someone in the group comes up with this story that maybe she went to see her ex-boyfriend who had been at Wakefest or not at, I don't know if he was at Wakefest proper, but he was at yeah. the event. Okay. Yeah. Um, and that's Clint, right? Correct. Okay. Uh, and I know that's one of the things you guys can look forward to by jumping into this podcast. Um, you interview Clint. I do. Uh, and we get much more clarification about his interaction with Lauren and what might and might not have happened around all that. So how many people did you find that said we can confirm that these three were asking around for Lauren or trying to find her in any way? Um, I have talked to quite a few people. I don't know exactly. Um, I have two people that said she, Hannah asked a question about Lauren. If, you know, anyone had seen her other than that, that's all I've got. That's it. Two people. That's what I have. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Now on the flip side, that's not, she asked everybody if you ask her. Gotcha. Gotcha. Pretty amazing. And you have talked to, I mean, you've talked to employees there. Um, I mean, you've, you've yes. talked to, how many people have you talked to that were there? Oh, I didn't, you know, I, it's so funny because this case is where I'm going on two years. I'm still talking to people. Yeah. So I have absolutely no idea, but I will tell you if they had been out there asking a bunch of people, I would have a pretty good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in the Crime Watch Daily segment, Harry Elder says that only four people knew about the body in the water. And it, this is one of those things where I'm just wondering, what's the accuracy of this statement? Because, you know, one person overhearing that in a crowd like that, they're going to turn around. That news is going to spread like wildfire. So He's pretty accurate at that moment. Okay. Okay. So we do think that it was a very confined group that knew that there was a body floating out there. Yes. Okay. I would say that that statement, I would say it's hundred percent correct. Okay. Which then kind of makes it even stranger that, um, the boys start approaching when the boat is going out there to, to basically check on her. Right. Well, of course their friend was missing and they were frantic, right? Right. Right. Yeah. Um, did Yarchuk or Melanson note any wounds on any of the other three people? Um, you know what? No, we, we, no, um, they're okay. So let me kind of set them up. So they're off duty police officers. And when it happened, when Wakefest was finished and they found the body, you've got all the boaters coming in. Mm hmm. And you've got Lauren's body being found. They had to turn it over to law enforcement and go handle people leaving, people wanting to stay around on the dock. Right. So they had their interaction with those guys and went to do their job. Okay. Gotcha. Um, but we do have Yarchuk saying that, you know, he turned on his investigator mind a little bit, started noticing some things and it appears that he's got a pretty good memory and recalled a, a lot of details that now that I've seen the photos that you sent me, thank you, uh, actually do line up with analysis that he has said time and time again, particularly about the wounds uh, on the back of her shoulders. Uh, and of course, the triangle mark, which we'll get to by the end of this conversation as well. In terms of the official investigation, were any polygraphs conducted anywhere around this investigation? No. 
not one. Um, basically, at the end of my brain scratch, I kind of came to the conclusion that it seems like the local law enforcement drew a quick conclusion about it being an accident, uh, found the information to support it being an accident, and then kind of moved on. Is that your assessment as well? That is my assessment. And to the point, and I, I want to mention this because I'm seeing it more and more, where the medical examiner took a summary mm -hmm. of what the police said and put it on her or his, I can't remember, now I don't remember if it's her or him uh, <laughs> who signed it. I've seen so many recently, but the medical examiner signed off on a summary. I've never seen that happen before where a medical examiner kind of speculates that she fell off because she's drunk. Uh, it signed off on the detective summary or on the medical notes? <laughs> Medical notes. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, I've bumped into some cases where I've seen that before, and it drives me crazy every time I do. I, it's weird because you look at a document like that, and you get the sense that this is supposed to be a scientific process, a scientific document. But for some reason, the detective's notes will sometimes wind up in there, um, and that will sometimes affect the considerations. Uh, yeah. I don't understand why that happens. And if maybe we had a little bit more unified processes in this country in terms of these investigations. <laughs> we yeah, might, I know, right? Yeah, I mean, you, you run into this exact same case in a different state and you're gonna see all kinds of different things happen around it. It's just, it's mind boggling. Um, okay, so the family wound up paying for a second autopsy. Do I understand that right? That is not correct. Okay, I read that. <laughs> I did. I, I read that too, actually. Um, no, that's not true. Uh, we've had medical examiners look over the documents, but we, the family chose not to exhume her body. Okay, gotcha. Totally understand that decision. Um, so what did the medical examiners that the family paid, what did they conclude that was different from the original analysis? Um, I think the areas of question were the lividity. Um, yeah. it, it wasn't matching up with her time of death. Also, the um, if you look at her, I don't know what pictures actually I sent you at this moment. So her fingers are kind of wrinkled, but her yeah. body does not look like it's been in the hour uh, in the water for twelve plus hours. Right. Um, let's see that and oh. Hemorrhaging. So in her throat, you can, that's, I did send you that one. That yeah. was, a, um, I probably should have warned you on that one. It, it was definitely the, the most shocking of the photos. Um, but no, I was, it's okay. I, I see things like this. I, I get it. Um, but the, it was the, the lar larynx, right? Or larynx. No. It was her throat, and the mom said her larynx was crushed. Her mom doesn't know the difference between the throat and the larynx. So okay. she had hemorrhaging in her throat. Okay. There's a difference. Her larynx was not crushed. So I want to be very clear. And you have to understand sometimes when you're talking to the news media and your mom, you're you're saying this, but you don't know there's a difference. And that I mean, it just it's it's her throat had hemorrhaging. It was not noted in the medical uh, report and her nose was broken. Now, for the throat hemorrhaging, because you did send me a photo that shows uh, her face and neck a little bit. Did there appear to be an external injury that matched the, the throat hemorrhage? Because I didn't see one. No. So what you are looking at is the difference, and this is where our medical examiner came in. So there is hemorrhaging, but that's from being held down, not strangled. There's a difference. Oh, okay. Gotcha. gotcha. Didn't know that, by the way, before I did this case. Yeah, yeah. And there's no possibility that that hemorrhage was the result of uh, the fall and the way that her spine compacted, I mean, as it's being described by the, the professionals on this? Um, you mean the Nashville medical examiner? Is that what you, okay? So, um, you know, here's the thing. No way is, a, I, I'm not going to go with a concrete, there's no way, but I will say more likely than not, it did not happen the way uh, they presented it. Um, I would probably... 100%. I know it's not that way. Okay. However, I want to make this clear. I know she fell. I know she fell. I think I know where she fell too, because something we haven't talked about. So you keep asking me questions. I'm waiting for the big ask on something. No, no, no. Let's go for it. You're, you're the detective. Okay. What am I thinking? Well, well I don't know if you're going to go there. That's there were two campsites. 
Okay. Uh, yeah, we can, we can, we can definitely touch on that. There was two campsites up there. Um, which means there's other people staying at the second campsite or are they split between the two? They're split between, between the two. So there's a, a split between them. One campsite has the main tent, you know, all the, the chairs. And I think it had four of the, the hammocks. Okay. The other one had two, had two chairs, but here's the thing. When you walk up the, where Lauren was supposedly last seen with Chris, it's the campsite to the left. And when Chris Yarchuk went up there, guess where all her things, the shoes, the phone, all that was the campsite to the left. We have photos where those things are now to the right. Yeah, I, I remember hearing about this uh, in one of the episodes that at one point it looked like the items were actually right outside of the tent door. Correct. Which um, when I've gone camping in the past, especially my shoes, that's exactly where I would place them if I was going in the tent. And one of the things that kind of bothered me about um, this when I covered it last week talking about this situation of them camping up there and, and doing all this was the tent did not look small. It looked like you probably could have fit three people in there if you wanted to. Yes. And I actually have a better picture for you. There were two huge, um, like I would say full size, uh, blow up beds. Okay. So it's very big. Okay. And I was wondering why would um, Lauren wind up sleeping outside. Why wouldn't Hannah invite her to be in the tent? And yes, they're kids and maybe, they, you know, they're going to do some stuff that they don't want their friend around to see. But I mean, come on at some point in the night, you know, why not allow your friend to come in? Um, I don't, I don't know. It's just, it really kind of bothers me. And then when I hear that there's a photo of essentially the shoes being right outside of the tent, uh, really raises the question and possibility of uh, Aaron kind of being involved in this some way, if there is more connectivity between the two of them. One of the other things I was interested in is that he already knew Lauren because he basically previously dated a friend of hers. Correct. Well, and, and it's a small town. Okay. Okay. So where they're from, they pretty much kind of, that group knows each other. And did... Have you found anything in terms of their relationship? Did they get along specifically Aaron and Lauren? Um, now there, Aaron has put out that he had a fling with her. Okay. I haven't found anybody to back that up, wow. but I don't know that. I mean, that's, there are two people that know whether that's true or not. And one's dead. So um, okay. I don't know. Uh, I know some people in the comments have speculated a little bit about maybe was there something strange going on in terms of this group of three, some type of sexual activity. But we do know that Lauren, uh, at least at the time, was on her cycle. She was menstruating. <laughs> she was not. She wasn't? <laughs> Surprise. What? <laughs> Didn't I hear that from the Oh, official? yes, you heard it. Oh, absolutely. You heard it. Wow. Wow. And that she, wasn't that part of the excuse why they didn't run the rape kit? Yeah, there was a tampon in. But um, if you look at the medical examiner's documents, we took it. We contacted Lauren's OBGYN. Or actually, it's GYN at that age. And um, look at the lining of the give this to your listeners. Um, look at the lining of her um, uterus. Yeah. And they found that she was not actually at the time. Wow. Let them look. Man, the twists in this case, it just does not stop. I know. That one was a big one for me. Yeah. Yeah, that is. Um, and it just, once again, kind of, it, I keep seeing this image painted of the authorities not conducting the investigation properly. And then when you hear something like that, where it's like, well, of course we know she wasn't sexually assaulted because, you know, she had, she had a tampon, which already is a terrible assumption. But then to hear that even that bad assumption is not based in truth. I mean, really, of course, people are going to question what's going on in this case. Of course, families are not going to feel content and happy with the story they've been told. And thankfully, She's got a family that's able to hire the resources to actually try to dig in on this and look. Right. 
And here's the thing about that is um, in order to get a rape kit done in the state of Tennessee, it has to be requested by the police. Okay. Gotcha. Which we know based on the assumption that they were running on, they probably weren't even looking in that direction. Um, wow. So they, they went up to the boat and, or they came up uh, on her body in the boat and said she was drunk and that's it. Yeah. Um, was any water found in her stomach or lungs? I've seen kind of conflicting reports about water in her lungs. There weren't. She wasn't drown. Dr- she did not drown. Okay. Uh, what's the official conclusion from the medical examiners on that? Um, he said, and again, uh, the medical, I need to be careful because I can't remember which one this is. Um, the medical examiner said blunt force trauma to yeah. the head is what killed her. Um, but they said possible drowning. Yeah, that's really bizarre. I'm, I, I guess, and, and we're talking about a girl I've learned a bit more about through uh, the podcast. Uh, she used to be a lifeguard. She did. She knew how to swim. Plus, she's a dancer, you know, so she has balance. She can swim. She knew water. Yeah. Yeah. So even if she did hit the water, if she was conscious at that point, the likelihood of her drowning is practically zero. But we don't know if she was conscious. And quite honestly, we don't even know if she was still alive at the time where she was actually, you know, coming to the water. Uh, Or if she was, she might not be alive for much longer from that point forward. Um, but no, no water found in the lungs. Okay. She were, didn't drown. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, were any fragments, uh, splinters of wood or anything from brush or pieces of rock, anything found in her skin? No. Nothing like that. No, we, no, it's not noted at all on the report. Now, what's interesting to me is I've looked at the photos you've sent me and I do see, several photos that look like she took some type of fall. There's, there's a little bit of a nick on her knee. Uh, the front of her knee looks, I don't know that it's dirt, but it does look like it could be just kind of lightly scraped up. Mm -hmm. Um, the damage that happens to the back of her shoulders, it's, it's almost frustrating to me to see that damage because it looks like a wound that quite honestly, most people could survive. Um, not knowing what type of force exerted that the cuts are not very deep. The bruising around it is somewhat minimal. Uh, it's pretty much placed on the shoulder blade on both sides, which you think would product, uh, protect most of her organs, at least from, you know, being directly punctured or something from back there. Um, it's, it's almost frustrating to look at the pictures because you're wondering what happened. What, why is this girl just not breathing and standing up and walking off this table and telling us what happened? Mm-hmm. Um, But it does look like she took a fall. I mean, I do see a couple of small nicks on her legs, but not to the extent where I feel like she rolled down 40 feet of hill, not to the extent where I think she encountered a tree on the way down or a bunch of rocks or something like that. Um, That's really what's confusing me about this. So you keep talking about your theory about knowing where she fell. Where was it? Where do you think this happened? I I believe it was between the two campsites. Because there is a definite drop between them. Okay. So you have to go campsite number, you know, the, let me do it this way. The one on the left and then the one on the right. Well, the main one was the one on the right. The one on the left, if you, either way, you're going to drop down. And I believe she did fall. I I have absolutely, um, I, I believe she fell based on the injuries and stuff. But she did not fall down that that cliff into the water to the second cove. Right, right. Interesting. So are we assuming that if she did fall, that possibly some type of either a cover-up effort or potentially a rescue effort, maybe they went down to see what happened to her and then found that the injuries were fatal and that they had to cover it up because they were worried for some reason. Something is that what we're talking about here? Some something like that? I, I'm just saying that she fell and what happened to her body after that, she, it, I can tell you what didn't happen. She did fall, but she did not fall into the water to the second co. What they did, I, I honestly don't have the answers to that, John. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, wow. So you talked about on her feet, there was only one little Nick that was found. <laughs> 
uh, her hands, which is a little hard to tell because of the water that we talked about. They were kind of waterlogged, but there didn't seem to be any obvious cuts really on her hands that I saw. No, she, she did have broken some broken bones. And, you know, I have had people speculate that it's a defensive wound. I don't know that. Again, unless I have the proof, I'm not going to say it's a defensive wound. I think that... Um, she did not have, if you're looking for scrapes, they're not on there. Okay. It, I've been up there. I, I don't even know how many times I've been up there. And just, of course, I'm older, but going up that cliff and trying to go down, I have just gone two or three inches and I've scraped the fire out of my hands. Right. So, I mean, you fall on the sidewalk, you, you have more injuries and it's so dense. We did, I did a drone and, and I did it during the season and then after the season to, to see. Mm -hmm. And we did it, you know, obviously more than once, but there's no way a person can fall through that brush and all of that mess and rocks and not have more injuries. Right. There's just no way. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It, it really doesn't make sense after looking at the photos for myself. It doesn't seem like it's that type of fall. But to your point, perhaps a fall to a different, like a plateau that happens to be there or something. Exactly. Wrong. Okay. Gotcha. Um, the family says that there are f at least four versions of the story that they've heard. Uh, can you just tell us what the major differences are in the story that they're hearing? Sure. Originally that night, uh, one of the stories was that Lauren didn't come back from the bar to the cliff. And that was told by two separate people. And um, that's that was debunked right away because uh, Chris Yarchuk saw them. Right. Um, so that's one. The other one was she went to go see her. She was crying about her ex-boyfriend and wanted to go see him. We have proof that obviously that's not true. Um, and you got to feel sorry for that kid. Yeah. Um, and then, um, the other one was, um, let's see, she went to a houseboat, uh, that night and we know that didn't happen. And what's crazy about the houseboat one that even somebody, I am not an outdoor person at all, but you can't get a houseboat to go in that area. You don't drive a houseboat in the middle of the night to go pick somebody up and you have no cell service. So how's she talking to somebody? Right, right. Yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, and you actually touched on something I wanted to mention as well about listening to the podcasts. You get a real sense of people that are trying to be helpful in this investigation versus the ones that are not being helpful. And that's a big part of the issue with looking into this is the people that are there are ultimately not being very helpful to the others that want to understand it. Uh, however, I do think, uh, you know, Clint obviously seems to be coming from the right place and really wants to be helpful in that. Um, there's several examples of it, but it just as you guys are listening to the podcast, keep an ear open for that. Who do you think is being helpful here? Who do you think is not being helpful? And that really leads you to the question of why? Why are these people doing so much to seemingly protect something? And, you know, honestly, Sheila, I even wonder if it's if it's a truth that is not as bad as we're thinking, if it's just that one of them feels partly responsible in some way and has enacted this, you know, control over his two friends to, to keep them quiet. Um, I don't know if it's something as malicious as, you know, I think the worst case we could be talking about here is that she was attacked, that this was, you know, some type of rage incident where uh, someone wanted to end her life. Or is it something as silly and stupid as, you know, someone spooked her or trying to scare her, have a little fun, and she went off the side of a cliff and they feel responsible for that? Um, I don't know. But the way that they're treating it in terms of trying to keep the truth away from everyone else, I think is pretty obvious. And that's, that's what's really hard to swallow here. So I think that, um, yes, I think that it could be an accident that, you know, you always go down that road. Is it an accident that's just trying to be covered up? But the problem is 
that day, there are too many different stories already. Right. So I don't know. Yeah. I, I can't, I'm not buying that it's just a cover up. You make a good point. If it was a simple accident and they were aware of it, uh, the story would probably be pretty straight. Um, but also on the flip side of that, if there is some really malicious intent in there and someone is exerting control, isn't he going to have at least the major points of the story pretty much straight as well before he lets these people go back over to the dock? You know, um, I don't know. It's, it's a really interesting question and it's just the toughest. It's probably the, one of the toughest things about this case to understand. Mm -hmm. Uh, there is kind of speaking along this line, there is a very interesting moment that happens when you're interviewing Hannah and she gets a phone call. And on that phone call, uh, in the media, I read that you overheard him saying, stick to your story. Mm -hmm. It is clearly Aaron. He is clearly saying that to her. He is basically hounding her throughout the whole interview. And as a matter of fact, off of the heels of one of his phone calls to her, <clears throat> she basically stops the interview or tries to. Tell us a bit about that moment. What was going through your mind while you're sitting there and you hear that? So what, there are things that you didn't see in the video that, or here, I'm sorry, here, because mm -hmm. there's a video of it. Um, first of all, in the state of Florida, it's a two-party state. So we had to get permission from Hannah to, to taper. And what was interesting is Bricks is down there at that same time. Right. And in the corner of the tape, well, first of all, Bricks moved my stuff around, um, which was interesting. And in the corner, when I asked certain questions, I really wasn't concentrating on Hannah. I was watching his reaction. Mm -hmm. So Bricks was on the computer, obviously talking, in my opinion, to Aaron. And he was certain... Um, times you could see him going back and forth and pacing and stuff. So I knew which areas uh, were a hot spot for him. Okay. That's the first thing. So with Hannah, she kept getting phone calls because Briggs let Aaron know that we were there. Mm -hmm. He made that call to Aaron. And I don't know if it's, gosh, this podcast, I don't know what's in it anymore. Um, I've listened to so many edits, but I surveilled them beforehand. Right. So I knew their schedule and I knew how long it took Aaron to get home. And of course, Hannah was late that day, but, um, you know, he didn't want us talking to her and he was home awfully fast. Yeah. 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 I heard that in the version that I got, uh, you talked about the fact that from that last phone call, um, to him appearing at the door very fast, but it was a series of phone calls and I heard her uh, text messaging going off in the middle of that. Right. I, th I think I could even hear when bricks went out to a car and started the car. And then all of a sudden it was back just a minute or two later. Um, yeah, there's a lot going on in, in that tape. And of course, when we have things like that popping up in this case, how are we supposed to stop? I mean, how are you supposed to ever let this go after you've heard something like that? You know? Yeah. And I wish that, um, you know, I wish that I was able to talk to Aaron when we got there on record. But when he came in, he did not want to talk on the record at all. Yeah. Well, that was that was fairly obvious just from how he was trying to clam her up. And uh, just to let the audience know, uh, they have gotten married since they moved to Florida literally weeks after this incident, uh, which is another whole aspect that the podcast is kind of going into, you know, is is a strange that they moved that quickly or not. Uh, some of the authorities are saying, no, 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 no. We know that at least one of them was planning on moving to Florida, but that seems to be uh, contested. Um, and since, uh, I actually have a, uh, a comment from someone that is an ex-girlfriend of Aaron that, um, took to the message boards on brain scratch when I released it and started, uh, you know, basically trying to defend his position, which I, I really have no problem with. Her name is Jessica. Uh, she's known Aaron since the fifth grade. She was clear that she had partied with Lauren. Uh, on several occasions, she called Lauren a party girl. Basically, the gist of her messages are, 
Uh, this investigation is unnecessary. Uh, you know, you don't know what you're doing, of course. And uh, apparently the whole community thinks you don't know what you're doing. Uh, her mother is way overreaching in all of this. But one of the more interesting comments was she's saying she's pretty sure that there would have been other drugs going on at this event. Was there a toxicology run on Lauren? Yes. Zero drugs in her system except for alcohol. Alcohol is the only thing found? Yes. Okay. But there were drugs on top of the cliff. We have witnesses that said there were mollies and moonshine and stuff. Okay. All right. So definitely more partying going on. But from the toxicology, we know that that's not a factor in terms of, of what happened with Lauren. Um, and now we get to the biggest point of contention for me. This is the type of evidence that I always really latch on to. And that is the triangle in her chest. Uh, when I talked about it on Brain Scratch last week, I talked about the position of the triangle and it would mean, uh, which the Archuk basically said the same thing, that her head and arms would have been in the boat and the rest of her body would have been hanging over the front and kind of outside of the boat. I still wonder, I, I don't know enough about kind of the weight differential, but I wonder if her being at the nose of the boat like that if her body wouldn't have just actually gone into the water or if there was enough of a split in the weight with her head and her arms kind of being forward. Um, but the official excuse we get is that it is part of a boat lid in the TWRA's boat. Have you found this um, box that they supposedly put her face down on? Okay, so here is an area where I disagree with Chris Yarchuk. Okay. So, um, I did get the boat, okay. the actual boat and, um, myself and several other people went on that boat and I believe, uh, again, I, I, Gray is another one. He and I disagree on this. So, um, She's I, talking about Gray Hughes, which many yeah. of you are familiar with that he's, he's, he's a mutual friend of, of us as well. Yeah. He's fantastic. And he's the guy I go to, to tell me I'm wrong. Yeah. Um, he and I disagree on this. I believe it is from the rescue boat. I'm the only one that seems to believe it's from the, other than the authorities, but I'm the only one that believes that. Well, it'd be really easy to prove. Did, did you get a picture of the box? I, I did. But again, it's, it's, it, I had Gray try to match it up. He says it doesn't. I believe it does. I mean, I don't know. Gray is smarter than I am. I will tell you that. <laughs> and he is really good at pointing things out to me. He's a detail guy for sure. Oh my gosh. To the point where I don't argue with him very often, but this one I feel pretty strong about. I think it is from the rescue boat. Would you mind sharing that photo with me so I could show it to the audience? I'm, I'm going to hold it for the podcast, but after sure. that airs, <laughs> okay, I will share it with you on that episode. Yeah, I'll definitely yes, do. Yes, I love that. Yeah, I'll do an update on it. Maybe I'll even pull Gray in on a conversation about that. Maybe the two of us will get together and bounce brains on that. Uh, okay. That would, I would love to hear that because, uh, again, he and I don't disagree very often. Well, and part of the things, one of the other things where we – I, I feel like you quickly gained respect in my book is uh, you wanted straight information from me. We were talking about the, um, the, the Jonathan Cruz presentation that you had done at that point. Right. You made no qualms about it. You know, don't protect my feelings. I'm, I'm looking for straight info. And that's part of what I appreciate about our relationship is I feel like I can tell you, hey, if, if I don't agree with you, I don't agree with you. And here's why. And I right. feel like you're actually going to hear it and consider it which is a big part of looking at all these little pieces of this case or any case and trying to be objective about it. I've got to look at it from this side. I've got to look at it from that side. And you looking for outside opinions like that and considering those opinions, I think uh, just makes you better at your job. It's one of the things I respect about what, what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm not always right. <laughs> yeah, no. And that's part of it. You, you, you can't be. You have to run on the best info you have. And then if you find better info, you know, sometimes it changes your position quite a bit. I think um, right. it's funny because the uh, ex-girlfriend of Aaron kind of mentioned your first case. Uh, oh, yeah. Can I tell you about that? Yeah, yeah, please do. So um, I 
It, it was a, that's very interesting because that comes back to haunt me, but that's the information is incorrect. So I went up against a police on a case and I was pretty firm on my beliefs. Right. And that particular case has gone to trial and they had to say they were in fact wrong. But when I went up against them, they crushed me in the media saying I was a liar. I admitted I was a liar. That's not correct. Oh. They, they intimidated me and came to my house and took things and intimidated me and said they were going to throw me in jail. And I was interfering with a case. So all that is not true. And what has been kind of nice about that particular trial happening is as soon as that trial happened, a news reporter, the only good news reporter um, that I've ever dealt with in Nashville, called me and said, you have to go on TV and tell what happened mm -hmm. and how you were threatened. And I did. Awesome. So I was not lying, um, but I'm not as powerful as the state police. Yeah, no, I've I've had my share in my life of bumping up against administrations, and these are mechanisms built on power and trying to maintain uh, their own survival in some cases, and they will go to all kinds of lengths. Uh, do you want to give a shout out to this reporter? Because I love calling out great reporters. Oh, Dennis Ferrier, who is fantastic, and he's also following the... Um, the Lauren's case. About half of the articles that I used on last week's Brain Scratch were from him, and I already gave him a shout out of my own for doing such good work on this. That's uh, funny. Yeah, I always look for that reporter in every case I'm looking at. When I find a reporter that really cares and digs like that, I'm always sure to try to uh, point them out to my audience so that we know that there are still people like that out there. I feel like it's a dying art in a strange way. And I really want to support keeping people doing that. So I'm trying to support those guys wherever I can. And that's who I look for, John. I don't when I do cases in any state that I am, I look for that reporter just yeah. like you. I don't go to the police. I go to the reporter. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, used to be a day where the reporters would actually go on scene with police. And uh, unfortunately, that doesn't happen as much anymore, if, if at all. I can't even think of a case where that type of access is happening. Um, all right. So really interesting information on the canoe mark. Um, it was pretty interesting because on last week's Brain Scratch, I found an article that was quoting uh, Sheriff Jay, and it was like a quarter of this article was him basically kind of defending his position that the mark did come from the TWRA boat lid. But outside of that, that the mark disappeared that he's got a bunch of other photos of her body and the mark's not on there. The photos that you sent me, they look like they're in a medical examiner's office. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. So he's talking about the same photos I've seen. The mark is definitely still there. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. And I just recently, we just had a deposition in this case and um, it seems Sheriff Ray's not crazy about, he's up for election, by the way. He's not crazy about the media covering, covering this case. I'm sure. I'm sure. What is the current status? And I know you can't really go into too much detail, but what's the current status of this particular lawsuit? Uh, actually, I can. So we are doing depositions. Um, the judge threw out Hannah's case, and it's in the appellate court. And I think it's August 8th. We go in front of the appellate court in Nashville. Okay. I think it'll be thrown. I don't know. I think it'll be thrown back. Um, but... Um, the other three cases are going through depositions. Okay. So Hannah is the only one that's been removed from the wrongful death so Correct. far, and that's being Correct. appealed and might actually come back into play. Right. Hannah, Aaron, and Bricks pled the fifth. Chris Stout, since he was in jail, if he pled the fifth, then I'm not sure the legal aspect of it, but something would have happened to his sentence. So he has done a deposition. Oh, interesting. Okay. Any information that you could share with us from that? It's a good deposition. Okay. <laughs> Looking forward to hearing more about that in the future. Um, interesting twist that has happened with Chris. We kind of talked about a little bit earlier today. Is his sentence done? Um, I, you know, 
I don't, I know that he was being released, sentence done. I, I never understand how that works. Okay. And this is, he basically had too many DUIs and he wound up serving a year. One was, uh, yeah, I think it's been longer than a year, but yes. And then we were told yesterday that he's in state custody. I don't know what that means. Interesting. Wow. Hmm. I don't know. Okay. Uh, we also had another development and actually Aaron's ex-girlfriend that was in the comments talked about this as well. Uh, Aaron went through a bit of a traumatic injury. Correct. Uh, he had a head on collision, a head on collision and wound up being in a coma for a period of time. Correct. And as I understand it, he is paralyzed. <sighs> Just when you think these stories can't get worse, that is, uh, uh, yet another turn that I did not expect in any of that. Just wanted to share that with all you guys to let you know what's currently going on with this. Uh, and I, I believe, did he, did he and Hannah also have a child in this time? Yes, they have a, a girl. Okay. Okay. Wow. All right. Let's get to some comments uh, from you brain scratchers out there. Uh, first one from 7th Angel AD. I'm still inclined to believe that it was an accident created by the perfect storm of poor decisions and the friends with her tried to distance themselves from her death. Maybe they're guilty by omission rather than commission. Interesting wording. Uh, but I do feel like they're responsible. So we've kind of touched on this a little bit, but is there any scenario in your mind where this is still just a pure natural accident? Not after being out there and not after we have some other scientific, you know, it's hard for me to think it was an accident after being out there. If John, I swear, if I took you out there today, you'd say no way. Yeah. Yeah. What, what, where do you really get stuck with it? Um, the brush is the first part and we really tried to get a dummy to go down that hill. Yeah. The injuries on her body and where she was found. Okay. And the area where you do suspect that she slipped the kind of narrow between the two campgrounds, uh, what's off on each side there? Does it get to the water? Uh, you'd still have to go down the hill. You still go down the cliff. Yeah, you'd still have to go down the cliff. And a similar type of brush at that point? Absolutely. It would be harder to go down from where that was. Okay. I could see her. You know what? You just can't get past the, it's probably, let me think, it's probably a five foot drop. You can't get past to get to the, the water. But there are areas of that same rock where you can, right? I mean, people go up there and they jump. On the other side, on the 90 foot side. On the 90 foot side. And you would not jump off the 45 foot side because there's an angle to it. Right. And that's the side that faces the cove that she is eventually found in. Correct. Okay. Gotcha. Um, tiny bun, my husband and I hammock camp, and it is nearly impossible for us to share a hammock. It's incredibly uncomfortable, even in a two person hammock. And we're both very small people, not saying nobody could do it, but it sounds off to me too. Uh, someone else just kind of agreeing with the assessment. And you, do you think that they spent any of those, either of the two nights, uh, sleeping in the same hammock? Is there any reason to think they did? I, I don't know. I, I, I think that she took photo ops because that's what you do at that age. Um, but I don't know if she slept in a hammock with Chris. Okay. And I even if we take it to the point of there being some romantic level between the two of them, which seems skeptical, two of you guys sleeping in a hammock, really? That's the way that you're going to be romantic with each other? It doesn't seem like it's a very good situation on any front. So we've got... Sorry. I was just saying, we got problems all over this theory about the two of them being in one hammock. Well, and also, um, we also have problems with the romantic stuff. We have three different versions of that, too. Right, right. Lori McCormick. Um, oh, this is interesting because we actually didn't touch on the bite mark too much. But Lori McCormick says, I also want to say that the bite mark may be from wildlife. There are turtles in Center Hill that are literally the size of a tire. Has there been any analysis done in terms of that bite mark, trying to understand it more? 
Um, I, okay. So in court nowadays, bite marks aren't coming in. Right. Do you know, you probably knew that. Yeah. I brought that up last week that that type of analysis has been really shuttered and no one's using it anymore. Yes. But if you, we have a dentist that is 100% sure it's a bite mark of a human bite mark. Okay. But we're, we're not going to be able to bring it in. But using it as an investigative tool, um, could oh, you? Oh, sure. Yeah. And does it point to any particular person? Do you have marks to match it against? We have asked for um, dental records and we're being refused. Okay. So, but it'd be sure nice to have that. Um, and if I had nothing to hide here, please take them. Right. You know, um, also uh, to that point, it kind of also shows the angle of the bite mark, which was interesting too. What's interesting about it? It's not a straight on bite mark. Like it's sideways or? Yeah, it's sideways. Hmm. Yeah, that is really strange. Weird. Wow. More interesting things for me to think about. You know, this case has, it's been really a deep dive that I've done this week. Thank you for all the material that you've sent me on this. Um, but you, you, I overload, don't I? <laughs> well, yeah, but you've only got me started apparently because now I'm leaving with at least five, six more questions off this interview. Yeah. And I, I, there's one thing I do want you to cover is the clothing. Let's talk about it. What do you want to, what do you want to talk about there? So if, um, did I send you the picture of the clothing? I have the pictures of her in the water. Um, okay. I've heard about, it's something that's interesting. When I was listening to the podcast, I keep hearing people talking about white shorts, but the pictures that we see, she's wearing these kind of hot pink shorts. Uh, it is start, at least the podcast seems to be leaning in the direction that there might be something to that. We have a guy that's colorblind. So <laughs> that one's a little tough to call straight out. He's yeah, but, he's not our witness. <laughs> yeah, but the second time I heard it from someone else and the fact that they were actually describing shorts of a different style than the ones that she was wearing, I found very, very compelling. So wh what do you want to tell us about the clothing? Well, from the beginning, Sherry, the mom, has said those aren't her clothes. Oh. And, yes, and we have a recording of her saying that to the police. Wow. And, um, that's the first thing. So when I came in, I was told those aren't her clothes. And that's one of the reasons in the interview with Hannah, I asked whose clothes are they? And she said they were Lauren's. I don't know. Okay. But the one thing that I will send you this picture after we get off is, um, as a, a female and you're married, mm -hmm. ask your wife if her bra strap was twisted if she would correct that at oh, any given moment. I could already answer that. Yeah, absolutely. Not not for a I, second. Yeah. The second thing that bothers me is in on the bra is that the two clasps in the back are not hooked. That's another thing that women don't uh, walk around with the hooks not being clasped correctly. So it's on, but the clasps are not engaged in any way. So it's literally the two sides are are not connected? One at the very top, there are three class. Okay. First one is, but the second two are not. So you have the twisted shoulder strap and that one. I'm going to go with Lauren was pretty much a very uh, kind of girly girl. Yeah. And that's not something I can see her doing. And that's something Sherry brought up a long time ago and after interviewing her friends, it doesn't match with who Lauren is. Gotcha. Gotcha. That is a very bizarre twist in all this. Uh, another one for my list. Mm -hmm. um, strange, strange. So it seems to me that you're still of the mind in terms of one possible scenario where something bad happened, possibly in the tent. Uh, and from there to cover up what happened in that tent, someone might have put together this fall. Maybe the fall did not go as planned. And then they went and had to try to correct that by moving her after the fact into the water. So I am going to tell you what didn't happen, but I'm not going to speculate on what did. Gotcha. And so what did not happen is she did not fall from the top of that cliff into the water to the second cove. Yep. Yep. 
I think I'm reading you. <laughs> so Nina Armstrong asks, uh, did the second Emmy that was hired by her family run a rape kit? We know that they wouldn't have been able to run a rape kit because they didn't have her body. But did they have any different information in terms of the possibility that there might have been some type of sexual assault here? Um, okay. So there's bruising on her thighs. Okay. And I have worked with rape victims. I've seen the bruising before, but I don't know if they're from knees or whatever. I mean, I don't know. So it, it, to answer that question, we, we have no way of knowing that. But as far as other indicators that somebody could have been on top of her maybe potentially holding her down. I, I would run with that. Okay. All right. Well, that is it. Um, a couple more questions before I let you go. First of all, where can people find without warning? Well, okay. This is a podcast thing. I didn't know, John, <laughs> I didn't know I had to get approval from Apple. So that just happened yesterday. Oh, congratulations. I don't know. So, um, it'll be in, in the Apple's iTunes. App, I guess. Yeah. iTunes. It'll, it'll be iTunes. And what's the other ones? There's a few, it's, um, Stitcher. Yes. Okay. And our website, uh, without warning.org will have it as well so they can get it that way. And, um, the first three episodes will go out, uh, Thursday. Okay. So those have been released yesterday. If you guys are checking this out and I'll have a link in the description box below to without warning.org, make it really easy on you guys to jump in on this case and hopefully help us uh, with understanding it. Uh, Sheila, great talking to you as always. Thank you so much for your time. I really, really appreciate it. Anything you want to say to the audience before we go? Oh, I'm looking forward to hearing people's insight, whatever it is. I don't have a side. I just want to know the truth. I think that's uh, that's simple and exactly elegant, elegantly put. Very, very good way to close out today's episode. Thank you so much. Sit tight and I'll be right back with you just as soon as I... Close out the show with everyone else. Uh, Sprain Scratchers, thank you so much for your time and interest in this case. If you have ideas, theories, let's talk about them in the comment below, in the comment section below. Um, are you guys going to check out Without Warning? I'm telling you, some very interesting twists and turns that I experienced throughout this. I'm looking forward to many more uh, episodes and following this case. I think it's also really special the level of access that Sheila has been given for this case. And for that, we really have to thank uh, Lauren's family uh, for, for being so brave to be able to allow something like this to happen. And hopefully, this will be a model for other families to be able to follow in also of getting the answers using social media tools like this. So hope you guys will help us become a part of that. Take care, everyone. Have a wonderful day, a nice weekend, and I'll see you back here Monday on the Lord and Arts channel.